thank you for hosting us. For uh, please be here. Um, we uh, we share at HEBT uh, a vision around distributed and sustainable energy and mobility. So it's sort of the intersection of power and mobility. And at that intersection are high performance, affordable, efficient, and reliable electric motors and related power electronics. So uh, a little bit about us. Um, we um, we sort of sit at the at the intersection of hardware and software. We have a very multidisciplinary approach. Um, we're starting with core technology around electric motors, disruptive alternatives to um, induction and permanent magnet motors, focused on switch reluctance, which can, just by removal of the rare earth materials alone, reduce up to 60% of the cost in an electric motor, um, for example, in an electric bicycle application. Um, initial target markets in excess of $65 billion. Uh, we have initial purchase orders signed with Alpha customers for field testing, which would trigger potentially up to a million dollars and more in revenue with more than 12 targets pending on top of that. And we're also part of, uh, we have 10 patents, 8 issued and 2 pending, and we're also part of an ARPA-E consortium led by the University of Texas Dallas. So, as I said, um, actually Congress surprised everybody in the last day or so and just passed some new laws about energy efficiency. Um, at the same time, the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office recently reorganized around three key principles. So, those being sustainable transportation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. And electric motors are at the epicenter of all of that. But what's interesting about this is that while we've invested a lot in battery technologies, we've really underinvested in motors and power electronics, which is exactly where we sit as an organization. So one of the challenges with motors today is that the high performance motors tend to be um, permanent magnet motors, and permanent magnets today require rare earth metals. Um, we think this image is really interesting uh, because it's, it's a quite recent image of what it costs in terms of human and, and um, financial and environmental impact to mine rare earth metals. Rare earth metals actually aren't that rare, uh, but they are, um, the refining capacity is rare. And the reason why is because they're typically co-located in bands of ore with thorium. Thorium is radioactive, and so pulling these out of the earth is a, is a costly process in, in many senses of the word. Um, so while our competitive technologies use rare earth materials, uh, for the most part, um, we shift the burden to the electronics. So they use rare earths and we use software. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, um, we'll get into how the technology works in a second. Uh, but suffice it to say as we get started that we've built them, they work, it's patented. Um, on, uh, let's see, do I have a, yeah. So here we have a high rotor pole SRM. Here's the rotor and here's the stator. And then here we have a double stator SRM. We sort of joke around that we have a lightweight and a heavyweight model. Um, this is a project that we're part of at, led, as I said, by the University of Texas Dallas. We're working on the power electronics as part of the company. Um, but different approaches uh, sort of jokingly refer to it as you wouldn't put a lightweight fighter in a heavyweight fight. Um, and so forth. Um, so high rotor pole SRM is our focus. That's the one that we have license to at the company along with um, eight of nine other patents. And um, the high rotor pole SRM we think is best for high volume, low cost applications, especially below five kilowatts where induction machines really aren't a good option because they take a nosedive in terms of efficiency. So a little bit more about that. That's sort of what we mean here. Um, induction motors aren't a great option for efficiency below a certain size. Um, and permanent magnet motors have some cost challenges. From a reliability perspective, switch reluctance motors typically have less parts. You'll see that when we talk through the technology. And they also um, have uh, the option to have concentrated windings. Concentrated <coughs> windings are interesting because if you have a winding short in one of your phases, uh, then the, uh, the motor uh, can, can have limp home capability based on the remaining phases. So. Um, how do we get to market? Because I think one of the things that's interesting in clean tech today is if we can't make money doing it, then it's not sustainable. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the questions is uh, e-bike motors and motor controllers. Uh, some of us uh, sitting here in California view that as a niche. From where we sit specifically, it might be, although our, our colleague working on intersections in China would, would tell us that it's a huge market there, uh, which scares some of us here. 
So why would we pick that? Well, um, one of the things we like about that market is it's very large, growing very quickly at about 10% CAGR predicted between now and 2016. And yet, uh, it has high turnover as a consumer product. And we like it as a bridge to scale and to power electronics. Um, switch reluctance machines require a slightly different circuit topology to minimize the amount of silicon you use in the controller. And so in order to get there, we need to batch together 10,000 units. We've pretty much gotten to that point um, contingent on field testing. So um, the other market that we're actively exploring is we're in discussions with a multinational conglomerate to do some joint development on an HVAC product, and that's an extremely large market. So um, obviously we're past proof of concept. We're in the process of productizing the electric bicycle product, exploring HVAC, and the next option past that point would probably be appliances or pump applications. Um, one of the reasons we like those is there may be opportunities to leverage the motors that we're developing here and here into some of these other markets, which would just be efficient. So uh, we've developed a contingent pipeline of about $40 million with more pending. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, it's throughout the U.S. and Europe is our initial focus. The selected addressable market for the electric bicycle industry is $239 million in 2012. Um, financial projections, this is just actually a scenario of sort of one scenario upside based on e-bikes alone. Um, and one of the things we are trying to illustrate here if, oops, is um, we, we think we can hit break even within about 24 months of scaled funding. Uh, and we also um, project margins in our selected addressable market of a, close to 60% of the motor and motor controller system together. That's again at scale products, so once we start hitting about 10,000 units. Uh, and even within um, the more global market, even in China, potentially up to 30%, again, based on the fact that the motor is easier to make. So easier to make, we've already sourced contract manufacturer uh, in the United States and also potentially in Southeast Asia as well. Um, and these guys produce for, you know, GM, GE, Philips. So that's an exciting... Uh, partnership for us, relationship for us. Um, we've already begun to do design for manufacturability with their advice and counsel, so manufacturing scale is really not an issue here. Um, and you can see the steps to make a permanent magnet motor as compared to an induction or switch reluctance motor. Part of the other cost beneficial um, benefit here is actually in the process itself. It's just a simpler process. And that also enables the motors to be made more readily, partly because we don't need wearers, and partly because it's a simpler process, more elegant process, can enable the motors to be made really anywhere in the world. So for just-in-time manufacturing, it both um, protects them against the risk of the cost and supply chain, but it also creates an opportunity to make motors anywhere, uh, which could reduce the inventory holding and working capital costs for certain companies. Um, so why hasn't this been done before? Well, all electric motors are really enabled these days by better, faster, cheaper um, power electronics and subcomponents. Really, Moore's Law is helping us everybody here. Um, that said, um, switch reluctance motors in particular, because they, they burden the electronics, that's a particular benefit. And over time, everybody started experimenting with the controls and the software, but sort of forgot about the underlying machine design. So what's unique about our, uh, our approach is that we do electromechanical optimization across the entire system. And so what that gives you is you change the underlying hardware and couple that with software innovation. And that's how we've addressed um, the torque ripple and acoustic noise that you've seen has historically been a problem in, for this type of machine um, here in this animation. So how does it work? It's, we call it sort of disruptively elegant. It's steel and copper mixed <coughs> motor. Um, on the exterior you have, in this instance, the stator is on the exterior. These are the stator poles. And uh, rotor poles on the inside. And the copper windings, this is sort of an animation of copper, but the copper windings are wound around the poles of the stator. And there's an option to do concentrated winding, which means this pole and that pole are a phase, and so you wind one phase. You can also wind the entire set together. Okay. Um, and then you generate magnetic current, or you send a pulsation of electric current through the stator. And when you do that, it induces, hopefully the animation will work on this machine. Seems to have frozen. Let's try this.
guess we're having a little trouble with the animation here, but basically what you would see is that this would switch to here and here, and as that switches, it induces the, um, the rotor to follow because it wants to, to um, move to the aligned position. And so, in so doing, that generates, the switching of the electric pulsations of current generates reluctance torque. And that's why it's called a switched reluctance machine. So, um, the, other, the other thing that's kind of neat here is um, we have proprietary rapid simulation tools and trade secrets regarding controls and control algorithms. To the extent that there's concern about the IP going forward, one of the opportunities is really to leverage the controller the IP and the controller to protect the entire system and actually to grow up into essentially a power electronics and software company. And one of the things that's neat as we move forward is that since our machines typically would use a microcontroller or a digital signal processor anyway, you can it's sort of a built-in platform to layer on different wireless technologies as part of the motor, whether that's wireless prognostics for an underground pump application or pay-as-you-go technology in the emerging markets, etc. So we have um, a really great team, uh, some of the best machine designers and power electronics engineers in the world, and also combine more than 75 years of experience in business, federal and, federal and international policy, public and startup finance, growth equity, and so forth. Um, we're in the process of raising a $5 million Series A round. Um, the state of Illinois is potentially on standby to commit a um, million dollars or up to 25% of a term sheet of that. Uh, we've got some soft commitments from some investors right now already. Uh, we were actually recent winners at the National Grand Prize at the Clean Tech Open. Uh, so that came with some investment as well. And uh, the use of funds there would productize and commercialize our um, e-bike, get to revenue there and scale, and also um, support our ARPA efforts and potentially also close the JDA on uh, the HVAC product. Uh, we think that there's a path here that would be strategic acquisition. We also think actually that there's an opportunity where, as I said, we would grow up into a power electronics and software company and go public sort of like a Qualcomm kite might over time. Um, in summary, we, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of a neat mix. There's rapid validation uh, in going quickly to market in very large markets, capital efficient um, process and sort of approach. Um, key adoption drivers, obviously the, the rarest crisis is a real sort of um, linchpin for us. Um, critical material strategy at the governmental level in the United States and elsewhere is also helpful. Um, and Amory Lovins at one point had said that um, switch reluctance machines are a demand side alternative for rare earth, motors, rare earth materials. Um, so uh, huge markets and then obviously an, an energetic team gaining early customer traction with a long IP and uh, recruiting portfolio ahead of us. So uh, we're, you know, thinking differently about motors. Thanks for having us.